The making of a movie, for me personally, always eclipses the movie itself because it's a, an exploration, it's an adventure, it's a, hopefully a transformation. The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissel. I met Wes Anderson because I wanted to meet him and we just made a meeting through friends or agents or something like that. He came to a performance at the Wooster Group, a theater that I was working at, and we went out afterwards and we liked each other enormously. And he was like, God, it would be so great to work with you, but I'll tell you what, I'm just getting ready to shoot a movie. I'm going off to Rome, uh, to, it, uh, to Italy to shoot this movie, and it's all cast, but you know, when I finish it, maybe in three or four years, we can do something. And I thought, <laughs> great. And then about three or four months later, he called up and he said, you know that movie I was talking about? And basically, someone dropped out. Do you know who it was? I do, but I'm not telling you. Okay. <laughs> it's not nice to him. In fact, he dropped out, I think, for a paycheck and also for a movie that wasn't so successful. It was a fun character. I mean, it's Basically, uh, for people that haven't seen it, I mean, he's a blowhard German. You know, if we think of Germans being very efficient and confident and strong, and he had all that, but it wasn't true, and he knew it. I'll take Ned, Ogata, and Wolodarski. Thanks. Thanks a lot for not picking me. <laughs> There's something beautiful about um, that, that kind of character. Not only is Wes a pure pleasure to work with, not because he's clear, he's got a beautiful energy, and and he creates a sense of community and the world that he creates is very specific. But also in this case, the role wasn't completely on the page. He was always making these pieces and folding parts of the ensemble into these shots, these very complex shots. Life Aquatic is filled with these really complicated choreographed masters that are very beautiful. And that was great fun to do. And it kind of harkened back to you know, not back, I mean, I still work in the theater, but it was like theater work a little bit. We'd work all day to get these very complicated shots and then we'd pull the trigger and do it, you know? And by the end of the day, uh, you'd have a whole scene. So it was a, it was a movie that, as price, precise as he is, it developed as we were doing it. He'd have a shot and he'd say, Willem, why don't you go in there? And so there was stuff invented on the spot, even with his wildly well prepared, very clear, very um, detail oriented way of working. Bill Murray, Bill Murray, he's a, I won't say a force of nature, he is a force of nature, but he's hard to pin down and he's so much fun to be with and he's a very generous soul. When you work with him, he, um, there's nothing predictable about him and he works with a lot of love, and uh, that's mixed with a little perversity, a little natural perversity. There's nothing ever strained about Bill. He's a very fluid person and performer. Spider-Man. Spider-Man was fun. Sam Raimi did a miracle thing. He made kind of a personal film out of a, you know, fairly big size, uh, partly effect movie. It was before, it was early in the game of, uh, you know, movies from, uh, from comic books and that sort of thing. So there was no, there was no template. I loved in Spider-Man, particularly playing the double role. Everybody thinks about the Green Goblin and that was fun, but s the more interesting role was probably the father because Norman Osborn, because you could play these scenes where it would switch from comedy to drama in a line. Yeah. Uh, I think of the scene where um, they have like a Thanksgiving dinner. There we are. Oh, it looks delicious. <laughs> Norman, will you do the honors? There's a couple of things that still make me laugh because they're so double-edged and they go back and forth between being really heavy and really kind of silly. Yeah. And the movie is filled with that. What do you want? To say what you won't. To do what you can't. To remove those in your way.
the mirror scene's cool. Sam Raimi gave me Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to read before I did that. But it was fun, and we, we basically did it in one take. I think in the final thing, for whatever reason, they cut it, but I sh we always shot it in one take, and it became a beautiful gang because I had to switch those things, and also for the camera to be in the mirror the correct way, and I had to dance with the camera a lot on that scene. There were a lot of mechanical effects in that because I think uh, some of the visual effects weren't so sophisticated then, and they were really fun to do, to be on a wire, to fly around. That's fun. It's, it's athletic and it's challenging and uh, it's, uh, yeah, cops and robbers, it's fun. The Florida Project. The Florida Project was a beautiful project because for many reasons, Sean Baker is a really strong, good, principled filmmaker and it was a beautiful opportunity. I've always loved movies where you can't tell who the performers are and who the found people are when they mix professional actors with people. In fact, I'm very much attracted to uh, films where uh, the actors are not, don't feel like actors. Uh, even when actors give performances that don't feel performed, I like that. So here was an opportunity to not be an actor. Good morning. Yeah, you, you gotta go home. There's cars coming through here, we got guests. I mean, sometimes there are very showy performances, there's very uh, surfacey performance, sometimes there's very performed performances, and part of the pleasure is the spectacle of it and the, the, the craft of it. But normally, soulfully, I like movies where I don't feel like an actor, and this was a perfect opportunity for that. Because Sean created an, uh, uh, an environment where we were mixing with the people of a real place and they were kind of guiding us on how to make the movie because it was really about their experience. Of course there was a structure, of course there was a fiction, of course there was a screenplay. It wasn't all improvised and it wasn't just about you know, having kids or, or untrained actors or first time actors. It wasn't just about that. It was, I wanted to be a manager of a hotel, <laughs> motel. And I was, and I learned how to do that. And it supported what I've always thought about performing. The important thing is, as an actor, you do things. You don't show, you do. And I loved also that movie because of what it expressed. It expressed our, you know, how important it is to take care of each other and what, uh, uh, what social responsibility we need to have for each other. Out of Eternity's Gate. Directed by Julian Schnabel, a film about a, uh, made by a painter, about a painter. I played Vincent van Gogh. It was written by uh, Julian and Jean-Claude Carrier. It's a, not a traditional biopic. When he was writing the script, he, asked, he sent me some material, sent me some biographical material, and told me to take notes of the things that I was interested in. And some of that stuff was incorporated into the script, so even though I wasn't involved in the script writing, I felt a part of it. And then he never really asked me to do the part. I did that just as a friend and just for my own pleasure. And then one day he invited me over to his house and they put a ridiculous red beard on me and uh, posed me and took some pictures. And then it was shortly after that that uh, he said, let's do this thing. And I never asked him what that was about. Maybe it was to show to investors. I don't know, I didn't even want to ask. Tell me, why do you say you're a painter? Because I love painting, I have to paint. I've always been a painter, that I know. One of the nice things about playing uh, characters based on characters that are uh, real life characters, based, uh, characters based on historical characters, is there's usually a wealth of material. You have a wealth of things to um, study and it changes how you think. I mean, I've played, the ones that come to mind are, of course, Jesus. Uh, a lot is written about him. Um, uh, T.S. Eliot, with Van Gogh, you have the paintings, you have the letters. It's a wealth of, of things to research. But then, of course, ultimately, you have to forget the research, and you have to forget that you're playing Vincent Van Gogh or 
or Jesus and try to find uh, the human aspect. <laughs> Boondock Saints. Boondock Saints was a movie by Troy Duffy that became something of a cult hit uh, pretty much pretty much all over the world, but it was a movie that never really had a proper release. It started with, if you don't know the story, Troy Duffy was working in a bar that had a lot of industry people in it, and he also really loved movies. And he basically had an idea for a movie, and he wrote it, and then he passed it to one of his clients, and they went crazy for the script, and there was a big bidding war, which Harvey Weinstein then won, and he was going to make this movie, and a part of his strategy to get this movie done was he started to do a lot of press about how he had found the next Tar Tarantino or something like that. There was a big hubbub about this movie before the guy even shot a foot. But then they started to have arguments about the casting, is my understanding, and it was put in turnaround. Then a company picked it up, and in that, in that version, then I was cast as this character, Smacker, who was a very interesting character. He's a, a very intuitive uh, detective. I'd like to thank whichever one of you donut-munching, barrel-assed, pod-pulling sissies leaked this to the press. He's, he's gay, but he, he has a special connection to classical music. There's many things that are interesting about him. It's basically a comic performance uh, mixed with action stuff and fun, uh, kind of politically incorrect things. I think that's why uh, it has a big f following. There's a, uh, you know, I can tell up when a certain person comes up to me, I know what movie they're going to talk about. It's that kind of movie. Platoon. Platoon was very important um, for me because not only is, was it a movie that I, I like very much and I loved the experience of doing it, but it also changed a lot of things in the sense that it was one of the first movies that was both a critical and popular success, and it was my first Oscar nomination. Also, it's, it kind of crossed over into hard news a little bit, because I think it did have an effect on uh, Vietnam vets, how they were accepted and how they were viewed. So it had a really positive social effect. I don't want to overestimate that, but as part of the movie, I felt that very much. If you're going to get killed in Vietnam, it's better to get it in the first few weeks. Also, the preparation was really... Uh, intense and wonderful and a little irresponsible. You probably couldn't do that now. It's been much imitated since that, this idea that you get some people and you get mater uh, military people to train them. What we did was really pure, I think. We got thrown out in the jungle. We didn't know what was going to happen. We heard something vague about two weeks training. The stuff, the, the people that brought us out to the jungle basically left us there. It was like we were Stranded, and then it was like, okay, your agents aren't here. You don't make phone calls. You don't do anything. Dig in. And we started to dig holes, and we made a perimeter, and we played war. And it sounds maybe silly, but the people that were training us were very sincere and very serious about this, and they wanted to teach us how to do soldierly things. And I think that was very important because it rooted the movie. We can never know what that experience is, but what we could do is we could learn how to do these soldier things and then apply ourselves in the context of the scenario. And then things would happen to you and it would be, with a little imagination, it would become a, a bona fide experience. So I think that was partly the heart of the movie and also the fact that it was a personal uh, story from Oliver that ran really deep, and also some of the people that were helping to train us had a personal stake in it. Burn! You know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. You ain't a firing squad, you piece of shit! I was like 31 years old, 30 years old, something like that. I was like an old timer. Most of the people, yeah. you look at that cast now, a lot of those people, that was their first film. Not only their first film, but some of these guys had never been out of the country. 
With, with Johnny, we had a beautiful scene that was cut, actually. But I could tell, even as we were shooting it, Oliver didn't think it was working. But I loved it very much because we were, we were out there and he was telling me about his girlfriend back home. And it was a very sweet scene. And we're doing all of this, cleaning ourselves out in the field, as these <laughs> helicopters are flying over our heads, like really close. So the idea of all that flesh and all this kind of intimate stuff among us and physically next to all this hardware going over our head really expressed something that I thought was interesting. Antichrist. It was one of my favorite experiences in film. I, I think Lars von Trier is really, um, you know, his films aren't for everyone, but I think he's a very gifted and brave uh, filmmaker. He's not maybe the easiest guy. I think he's got a nose to go towards uh, taboo subjects. Not because, as many people think, he's uh, uh, just transgressive or, or, or enfant terrible. It's really the stuff that interests him. And he's got a gift for film language. I think the, the prologue of Antichrist and the epilogue Are just gorgeous. That that's worth the price of admission, as they say. And then uh, the rest of the movie. Of course, it's difficult. Of course, it's ultra violent in in places. But I think it it explores some really interesting things about motherhood, about sexuality, about guilt, about mourning, about mental illness, about myths, about. Uh, certain things about women's uh, power, men's fear of women. Very delicate subjects. I think it really hits them head on. Some of my favorite films are films that express uh, sort of the making of them. And Antichrist was one of those that um, it looked like it felt. I do watch my, uh, the films I've been in at least once. So, because I'm curious about how they turned out. But generally, I don't linger. I mean, you know, really, when I see a movie, it's not going to really, I don't like to think about studying it or learning from it. I think you learn in the doing. I enjoy movies, but when it's my own, it becomes too e egocentric to really study it or look at it too much. Shadow of the One of the beautiful things was that was a film where I worked from imitation. And imitation has its limitations, but it's also a beautiful way to work because it frees you. And I worked with a mask, a literal mask and a metaphorical mask, you know? Did I kill some of your people, Marno? I can't remember. And that's, that also frees you. So I felt very free to goof around, to have fun, to be perverse, and to be this, you know, otherworldly character. The basic conceit, uh, the basic idea behind the film that, you know, uh, this director, Murnau, is going to use a real vampire, <laughs> you know, in the movie about a vampire, is kind of a, a, a joke and seems kind of facile or, or simple, but it, it, the way it plays out was pretty interesting. And you can mix elements of real horror and uh, comedy, which is tricky. Um, but for me, it was a dream because I had this heavy mask. I had a great model in the original of Nosferatu. So the movement and, and how to look and how to act, I could copy, start from there. And then once you're copying, it frees a certain energy that you would normally imagine you'd you'd use on invention to play around. I don't know, I, I just felt very free. I felt like I wasn't there. It, it played into a kind of uh, boyish sense of play and invention. Greta is in your last scene. That is when you can have her. After my dead scene? Yes. Don't expect realism there, Murnau. What do you mean? 
Don't cheat me, mortal. Nicolas Cage was a, a producer on it. And originally, I think this was something he developed for himself. It, it, it was created by his company or developed by his company. And I think originally he was going to play Nosferatu. And I don't know whether he got busy or the project was too small or for whatever reason, he started looking for other casting. I think he cast already John Malkovich as Murnau and he didn't know who he was gonna cast for the vampire and he cast me. And I remember right before we were ready to start, Nick came in and we did a table reading and he's a very inventive guy. I've worked with him on Wild at Heart and also on Dog Eat Dog, a uh, Paul Schrader movie. And I like him a great deal, and he's fun to work with. But at this table reading afterwards, he had lots of ideas, and we're gonna shoot the next day. And he had some ideas about how he wanted the, uh, the vampire character to be a movie fan. He thought that was interesting, and for me, I thought that ruined the whole idea. So I kind of argued with him. And I went back to the hotel and I thought, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> I've just had a, had a serious argument and maybe when I get attached to something, uh, maybe I'm not always polite, you know? I had a serious argument with him about this idea. Who knows whether the idea would stay? He's a pretty impulsive guy, but he was gone the next day and we proceeded as normal and uh, uh, I enjoy the movie. Wild at Heart. David Lynch was one of the uh, most fun people to work with and it was partly because he was so clear. He gave me a beautiful setup. People imagine sometimes that, you know, a good actor's director is someone that talks to you and pulls you aside and tells you how to do things. That hasn't been my experience. My experience is they create a world or they create a setup or invite you to collaborate in such a way that there's a logic to what you're doing. You're clear and the beautiful things happen in your presence or your commitment. You're experiencing the things that are happening. The best experiences are always when you get a good setup and David Lynch gave me such a good setup and really didn't give me any choices like in terms of costume. He's, he, basically brought this thing out on a hanger and said, Willem, this is your costume. And I was good with that. Normally, you'd have a conversation with the, this is what I think, this is what you think, blah, blah, blah. But it was very direct. And I responded immediately to it. And then he said, uh, we gotta send you to the dentist. And I said, why? And I read the script. I, I know that he had stumpy, discolored teeth, but I made the assumption that we'd just do it with makeup. He said, no, no, we got to we gotta make you some dentures. And I thought, wild. So we had these dentures made, and they were the key to the character. Those are dummies. Dummy. <laughs> I got those teeth, and it kept my mouth open like this in a way that, you know, I was able to tap into a kind of lasciviousness, you know? You go like this, you know, and all of a sudden you start sitting differently, you know, you start, you start feeling differently. That became the key. It shows that actors sometimes, left to their own devices, put limitations on themselves, because I would never thought of that. Right. Strangely enough, I just assumed something. It wasn't studied, it was kind of intuitive. But I think Bobby Peru is uh, one of uh, my most complete characterizations. <laughs> The Last Temptation of Christ. I played Jesus Christ in The Last Temptation of Christ. It demanded a lot of me, and when I was finished with the film, I felt finished, and that's a wonderful feeling. You felt used. You felt like you, you directed some energy in a, in a way and you couldn't do any more. Martin Scorsese had made this movie in his head ever since Barbara Hershey gave him the book Last Temptation. He knew it so well. He tried to make it before, this was like the second time he tried to do it. It was a very low budget movie. When I get a call from my agent saying, Martin Scorsese wants to talk to you, I was like, for what? He said, Last Temptation of Christ. I was like, for what role? He said, stupid, for Christ. And I thought, that's weird. And then I read the script and I said, ah, 
this is beautiful. And I met with him in the most direct way. Went into New York because uh, I, I was someplace else at the time. And we had a short conversation and he said, okay, let's do this thing. How I entered into that was quite simple and quite surprising. And it was very clear that, uh, you know, the emphasis was to find the human aspect of Jesus. And the first thing that I had to do is forget I was playing Jesus and to cleanse myself of certain kinds of expectations. Maybe this relates to what I said before about, you know, a performance that doesn't feel acted. I had to find how this very historic character, how he was a human being, you know. Can't he see what's inside of me? All my sins. We all sin. Not my sins. I'm a liar. A hypocrite. I'm afraid of everything. I don't ever tell the truth. I don't have the courage. And of course, the script and the whole everything supports that. But it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. We shot in Morocco, no trailers, down and dirty, shoot shot fast so that we never got you know, seduced into any big pageantry or got distracted. It was so essential. In fact, one of the few things that he had me research, he didn't gave me two things, an archaeological study about crucifixion, an article about forgiveness. Of course, I, on my own, I was reading the Bible a lot then, and told me to watch Pasolini's uh, uh, Gospel according uh, to Matthew. He said, this is more the direction we want to go, something essential, something human, something understandable. In Last Temptation, I wasn't at all prepared for controversy because I thought it was a beautiful film. I was leaving my house during the height of the controversy, and there was a guy sitting on the um, stoop. And I was walking out, and he said, hey, man, you, you made that Jesus movie, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, you're in a hell of a lot of trouble about that, right? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, that's what you do when you change the story, which I thought was a curious thing. Mississippi Burning, Alan Parker asked to see me. I read a script. Um, I thought it was a great story. I thought that I, I really liked Alan Parker. I knew Gene Hackman was going to be in it. And I thought, oh, to perform, to play the straight man to a colorful, great character for Gene Hackman, how beautiful is that? I can confess right now that initially on paper, my character seemed a little flat, a little colorless. In the doing of it, it became less and less colorless. But don't go messing this up just because you're partial to fooling around with witnesses. You Oh, come on. Ah! Um, it became a very beautiful character. And the shooting was so much fun. And even though the, the story is very heavy and involves a lot of tragedy and injustice and very dark themes, I got to say, shooting it was a lot of fun, you know, uh, because it was a, a combination of a really good cast, um, something rooted in history, but also partly invented. Alan Parker was just a lot of fun to work with for an actor. And Hackman was great, you know, it, just to be with him was great. I remember we were ready to finish and I had a couple more days to work. And Gene Hackman said, he said, let's go out for dinner and say goodbye. I wasn't close with him, I mean, we, we were good. Uh, he was very kind to me on the set and I liked working with him a great deal. Was very happy to work with him. And we had a little dinner and at the end, he said, uh, listen, I've enjoyed working with you. This might be a good movie. And uh, listen, you've got a couple of days left. You might want to see if you can uh, find some other colors. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty good. Like saying, Gene, I'm the straight man to you. You're the color guy. The Loveless. The Loveless was basically my first film. Uh, it was Catherine Bigelow's first feature. It was co-directed with a guy uh, by the name of Monty Montgomery, who was a producer for uh, David Lynch. So that's where I, I met Catherine, and we had a wonderful time making that movie. Uh, 
Haven't worked with Catherine since, but uh, that was really a good experience. It was a motorcycle movie. We're going nowhere. Fast. They were free spirit. I had never ridden a motorcycle, and there I am in New York City. I'm working at the theater. I don't have an agent. Catherine sees me in a theater piece at the Wooster Group in downtown in New York, and they call me up and say, we want to send you a script. I w we want you to be the lead in this movie. And I read it, and I say, great, yeah, and I want to do it. But I don't know what to ask for or anything. I, I, I'm not part of the, the movie world, right? And then they talk about, I don't want to lose the parts of this. Say, have you ridden a motorcycle? Of course, classically. What does an actor do? They lie. I say, I'm, uh, yeah, I have. Uh, you know, I haven't ridden in a while, but, uh, you know. And so they say, I get this part, and they say, okay, we're going to go out to Connecticut to ride on this, you know, 1955 big Harley hog, you know. And I think, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. So I start asking around if anyone has a motorcycle. I'm a young kid in, in New York City. I don't know anybody with a motorcycle, much less a, a 1955 Panhead, you know, a big machine. And that's before the Internet. So I'm going to the library to get a book on how to shift, you know. Is it one down, two up? You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm wrapping it around in my head. So we go out there. I still haven't confessed that I haven't. Uh, you know, ridden a motorcycle, and I get on that machine, and it takes off with me. I go riding, <laughs> you know, it takes off with me. I go, you know, through backyards of uh, some fancy neighborhood in Connecticut where this impeccably, lovably restored 1955 Harley Davidson, you know, uh, was housed. So I think they figured that out pretty quick, but they were patient with me, and I learned how to ride. Mr. Bean's Holiday. I mean, it was a strange choice for me to do. Um, I was happy to do it, and it was fun to do. I think one of the reasons I wanted to do it is I always remember Rowan Atkinson, not so much from Mr. Bean, but, but from Black Adder. And when I saw Black Adder, I just thought, this guy is fantastic. The highly artistic, but also highly illegal set of French lithographs. Everything! <laughs> the amusing clock where the little man comes out and drops his trousers every half hour. I was really sucked into what he was doing, so the idea to work with him was great fun. And then also the character I play, once again, kind of a blowhard, <laughs> what's the pattern here, um, was a uh, very full of himself uh, art filmmaker. <laughs> The guy with the video camera is fired. Uh, so that's something I know a little something about. <laughs> one of the things that we did that was really crazy is one of the scenes happens at uh, the Cannes Film Festival. So we stole the red carpet in Cannes. I think we had permission, but I'm not sure. We, on the uh, red carpet of a, a Portuguese filmmaker named Pedro Costa, who's seen, whose films are very serious and very strong, we invaded his red carpet. I felt guilty. I, I morally thought it was the wrong thing to do, but uh, we did it anyway. Uh, so that was fun. To live and die in the lake, Billy Friedkin, really fun to work with. Good script, interesting character. Um, I'm driving around in a uh, Ferrari. I've got a beautiful house. I'm also getting to learn how to print money. That was really fun and really fascinating. That's one movie that I've looked back at and I thought, you look like a little kid, you know, but you're playing such a heavy character. And I remember when I w was in New York when I was younger and I'd be going out to clubs, sometimes these real imposing guys would say, whoa, it's Rick Masters, you know. Somehow it worked, you know, that uh, that character was like, uh, had some, uh, you know, was scary, was, uh, made people nervous. Do you like playing the bad guy? Yeah, I do, but, you know, it used to be, uh, there, there used to be a fear that I'd get caught, you know, do it again, do it again, do it again, and that deadens you. It's not just a pride of an actor saying, oh, I can do other things. It just isn't interesting if you go to the same well. 
you're not you're not nourishing yourself. Bad guys are fun because they can do things that we can't do in life. You know, you can you can play around with your your dark side, and we all have it. I enjoy that, but I was always conscious of typecasting. And thankfully, as I get older, it gets pretty mixed up. But at the beginning of my career, people started saying this guy plays bad guys, and and I was worried about that. I'm not so much anymore. Maybe I should be, or maybe I haven't played a good bad guy in a while. Maybe I'm due. <laughs> okay. You write for me.